2020 was a weird year, and that weirdness reflected the TV shows of said year. That's because many shows had to be delayed due to Corona, and many had worse development processes compared to before. Despite this, I still saw enough shows that aired this year to make a top 10, as I watched 11, and that one honorable mention is the visual for this intro. Otherwise, I'll show a wallpaper for each show I talk about, an image of my favorite character from each show, and a screenshot of the IMDB page to my favorite episode from each show, whenever I talk about those. I will spoil all the shows on the list, so tread carefully. With that said, here are my top 10 favorite TV shows that aired during 2020. Number 10. Primal, Season 1 Primal was my least favorite show from 2019, and while it barely isn't this time, I was surprised to enjoy it more than Castlevania Season 3. That's because Castlevania was only somewhat enjoyable across 10 episodes, whereas Primal had 5 that I enjoyed quite decently. Admittedly, I didn't care much for the first two episodes, that were pretty slow and uninteresting, but the last three were all captivating. One of them was very emotionally resonant, another was action-packed with striking direction, and the last was filled with intrigue that should make way for more interesting developments in later seasons. It was very interesting to find out that this show might not be so primal after all, and that only parts of the world is, while other parts are far more civilized. A flaw with this show's continuation is that Fang somehow survived after seemingly getting brutally murdered by apes on steroids. And I suppose she had to survive, being the deuteragonist, but it was still very convenient. The release order for the episode certainly didn't help, since the first episode that got released showed Fang being alive and well, whereas the second one showed Spear taking care of a fatally injured Fang. I suppose that was the case because the virus episode was so relevant to Corona, but it did mess with the chronology. Despite having some faults with this set of episodes, I did enjoy it, so that's why it's on the list at all. Even though Spear and Fang are at the center of the show, I preferred Lula and Mira more so, and I'll pick Mira as my favorite character, because she brought dialogue to a show that's devoid of any. That is the selling point of Primal, but I'm personally not that impressed by that aspect, except in some cases, so I found it refreshing when Mira spoke, even though she speaks a language I don't understand. Her very presence makes the show more interesting, and I liked how she treated Spear and Fang. Even though the season final made the show more interesting, episode 8, Coven of the Damned, was my favorite. This was one of the cases where the lack of dialogue worked in the show's favor, as I don't think it would have been as impactful with dialogue. It was very sad seeing an old witch lady grieve for her daughter who died a horrific death, and her later joining her daughter in the afterlife was bittersweet. She was definitely the MVP of the episode, managing to break free from the witch tribe to help out Spear and Fang. She saw herself in both, as they also had lost their children, so the episode had some good parallels as well. It was beautiful stuff that almost made me teary-eyed. Number 9. The Mandalorian Season 2 I enjoyed the first season of The Mandalorian quite a bit, and while Season 2 was also fun, I wasn't as invested. I had more hype for the show when it was new, and I later came to think that I might have overhyped it a bit in retrospect. I still find it good, same with this season, but there are some episodes that are just underwhelming and certain decisions that bug me. That's especially the case with episode 2, and that's not due to Grogu eating eggs. Okay, it kind of is, but I wouldn't put the blame on him, as he's just a kid who doesn't know any better. I'm more irritated by the fact that Mando allowed it to happen. Not intentionally, but that just went to show his stupidity. He's stupid at other points too, often putting Grogu in danger, and inconveniently not using certain weapons when their use would be completely ideal. I also think the show has less going for it than fans tend to give it credit for, as it seems it's mostly beloved due to how it pays homage to the Star Wars universe. Granted, it does do that stuff pretty well, but it's not much to go on. I get it, it's fairly good content in the shit show that is today's Star Wars, so maybe I should just appreciate it like most others, but I'm just not that impressed by it. Regardless, this season did have some good stuff in it. Even though the show might have an over-reliance on returning characters, it was still pretty cool to see the likes of Bo-Katan, Ahsoka Tano, Boba Fett, and Luke Skywalker again, and they were implemented fairly well into the story. Baby Yoda was finally given some training, let alone a name, and it'll be interesting to see how he turns out moving forward. Most of the characters in this show are about as interesting to me as Boba Fett from the original trilogy, but funnily enough, this season made me like Boba Fett more than in those movies. I guess it's because he talks a lot more here, whereas he was a man of few words in the originals. 
Even so, his action scenes were also cooler than they've ever been, and the words he did speak were those of an experienced bounty hunter. My favorite episode of the season was probably the season final, that being episode 8, The Rescue. I wasn't as crazy about Luke Skywalker returning compared to most, but I can't deny he had an awesome slaughter scene reminiscent of his father's in Rogue One, so the return of the Jedi was fortunately done justice. The dark troopers were kind of done dirty, but oh well. The fight between Mando and Moff Gideon was really cool, and it was funny how Bo-Katan was about to turn against Mando after he acquired the Darksaber. The eye-to-eye -eye between Din Djarin and Grogu was very heartfelt, and might have been my favorite part of the episode, despite how negligent the dad he's been, but that's why it's good that he's leaving him in someone else's care. Number 8, Westworld Season 3 While I'm not the biggest fan of Westworld, each season does something that impresses me, regardless of how much I enjoy them overall. While the previous seasons have higher peaks, especially the first, I found myself consistently intrigued by season 3, more so than season 2 anyway. What was most interesting about this season is that despite not taking place within Westworld for most of it, the whole world itself is portrayed like Westworld, in that everyone's being monitored, controlled even, and have their futures predicted. All that's being determined by an algorithm, so it hits close to home, even though algorithms aren't that extreme, but they do affect some of our decisions. This meta-commentary was thus very interesting, as exaggerated as it might have been, but it is science fiction after all. Despite how interesting this concept was, Rehoboam did come out of nowhere, so it would have been more effective had it been set up in previous seasons. As is a Westworld staple, this season was very convoluted, as it followed far too many characters and subplots that were underdeveloped due to the sheer quantity, especially considering the season's shorter runtime compared to the prior ones. It was cool to see Aaron Paul become a major character this season, and he had a great performance as Caleb, but his character felt very inconsistent to me. Caleb was established as a pacifist at the beginning, but quickly began murdering people without second thought, and he just went along with the chaos Dolores was causing. I also found the ending underwhelming, being the weakest season final of the show thus far. Dolores' decision to save humanity rather than destroy it felt out of character, and I hated that William got killed and replaced with a host, in an after credits scene, no less. Even so, I found nearly every episode compelling, so I enjoyed the season quite a bit despite some very noticeable flaws. My favorite character this season was Charlotte Hale, or rather, her host. It was captivating seeing her develop humanly emotions, trying to fit into the Hale family and live a normal life, which was sadly cut short. That led to her turning against Dolores, which was a very interesting turn of events. I hate that she killed William in such a pathetic way, but I blame the writers for that one, not necessarily the character itself. I think my favorite episode was episode 5, Genre. This episode revealed Sarek's backstory, which was pretty interesting, and needed to explain Rehoboam's existence to begin with. It was an amazingly directed episode, especially the scenes of Kayla being drugged with genre, which is a very unique drug that lets people experience things like they're in different movie genres. I liked hearing Ride of the Valkyries, that's an awesome classical piece, and the light show with all the lights blinking was trippy, but very cool to see. However, the reason this episode is probably my favorite is because of the info leak that showed everyone their projected fates. That was a very impactful scene that changed everything in the world. I can imagine the outbreak being like that in real life. The later parts of the episode were admittedly not as enjoyable, but the content before that was enough for me to choose this episode as my favorite. Number 7. Better Call Saul Season 5 I've admittedly undervalued Better Call Saul in the past, and while number 7 isn't all that high, I appreciated season 5 maybe more so than any of the prior seasons. It was still very slow, which is mainly why I'm not as into this show as I would like to be, but I understand that it's necessary to make the bigger moments hit. On that topic, this season had plenty of big moments in it, and it's setting up what should be an explosive final season, which Breaking Bad most definitely had. It was cool to see Hank Schrader and Stevie Gomez from that show, even though they didn't do much, but they didn't need to, especially since many other characters really shone this season. The character drama between Saul Goodman and Kim Wexler in particular was super interesting. Although I expected it, I had pretty much the same reaction as Kim when Saul disrupted her plan, although I did simultaneously grin from just how vicious Saul was. 
I really thought that would cause a rift between them, but it funnily enough only drew them closer together, actually marrying each other to prevent such situations from happening in the future, which was a clever way to subvert expectations. It seems Kim really is breaking bad, so I can't see a happy ending for her, whether or not she survives. Mike's character also took an interesting turn, being beaten up from having to kill Werner Siegler, but picking himself back up over the course of the season. Nacho had an interesting struggle as well, trying to get closer to Lalo and being forced to join him. Lalo is a very charismatic antagonist, so I'm glad he didn't die this season, and he's sure to cause a mess in the next one. I don't have many issues with the season overall, aside from the slow pacing, and I did think it was a bit stupid for Kim to bargain with Lalo. She has her reasons, of course, but she should have figured it would put her in a really bad position, which will probably come to fruition in the next season. There were a lot of good characters this season, but my favorite was still Saul Goodman. I can't even refer to him as Jimmy McGill anymore, he's completely embodied his con lawyer persona at this point. I loved seeing his elaborate plays, like when he rigged the elevator so that he could discuss cases with another lawyer, or when he fooled everyone in the court by switching the accused with a lookalike. An especially funny case was when he simply showed a picture of a man fucking a horse so that he could use that as a metaphor for how much he hates Mesa Verde. Saul found a way to speak to that redneck when no one else could, and the way Saul and Kim protected that redneck was pure genius. It was funny how Saul shat on Howard as well, throwing bowling balls at his car, sending prostitutes his way, and publicly cursing him, that last one really showing Saul's true colors. So did the episode where him and Mike were stuck in the desert, which was really captivating, him almost giving up, but ultimately pulling through. Saul Goodman was already super complex, but this season elevated his character to a whole new level. My favorite episode was episode 9, Bad Choice Road. This one kept me at the edge of my seat, with Lalo questioning Saul after Lalo discovered the truth about how Saul came back with the money, and Saul trying to convince Lalo by lying. It was nerve-wracking for plenty of other reasons too, like how Lalo almost spotted the phone that Mike used to listen in on their conversation, not knowing what Lalo would do, who seemed to pry more and more the more Saul lied. Mike aiming his sniper rifle at Lalo, Kim moving closer and closer to its crosshair, and really Kim talking non-stop trying to defend Saul. All of this made me incredibly anxious, making for a really effective episode, and being a bit reminiscent to Breaking Bad's box cutter. I might actually prefer this episode over that one, as I felt the tension was even more brutal, but that might be because I've seen Box Cutter multiple times, so it doesn't have the same tension as it used to. Is this my favorite episode of Better Call Saul? I don't think so, as I'm pretty sure 5 0 from season 1 is still my favorite, but this one surely has to be in my top 5. Number 6 Star Wars The Clone Wars Season 7 the Clone Wars getting a final season was nothing short of a miracle, and since it's my favorite TV show set in the Star Wars universe, it was one of my most anticipated releases. So, did it deliver? Both yes and no. You see, the season was split into three arcs, the first focusing on the Bad Batch clone unit, the second on Ahsoka and some other gals, and the last of the Siege of Mandalore. The Bad Batch clones were fine characters who grew on me a bit, and it was great seeing Captain Rex and Anakin again, that are two of my favorite characters in the series. The plot of the first arc wasn't that interesting, but it was good enough, and it was cool how Echo got brought back and became a Bad Batch member himself. I'd say the first arc was just good, which I was fine with, but then the second arc was mostly a waste of time. It reintroduced Ahsoka, which was important to do, but the situation in which she was really didn't need to happen, or at least didn't need to be spent so much time on. The sisters she was working with were really meh characters, and I couldn't get invested in their struggles as a result. The worst insult was that basically nothing happened in one of the episodes, since it started with them in a prison cell and ended with them going back into that same cell. It also showed great incompetency not only on their part, but Ahsoka's as well, which dumbed down the character, who had grown so much over the series. It's a good thing the last arc was so amazing and a great way to end the series, but it doesn't really make up for how weak the arc preceding it was. Had that arc maintained the just good quality of the first, then I might have put the show in second place, but that arc was just so mediocre that I couldn't get myself to place the show that high. I can't deny just how fantastic the Siege of Mandalore was though, especially the beginning, which was really heartfelt and had an amazingly directed war, and the fight between Ahsoka and Maul was godly choreographed. 
It was also cool how the arcs coincided with the events from Revenge of the Sith, and lines from that movie were applied so well. Despite how much I love this arc, I don't think it's my favorite in the series, as I did find it odd that Ahsoka freed Maul, telling him to wreak havoc, which led to many clones' deaths, hyperspeed being dismantled, and even his escape, so that was a dumb move. I also thought the ending was a bit rushed. Still amazing, but not one of the best ending episodes I've seen to a show. Still, it was an incredible arc to end on, it's just a shame that the rest of the season was so underwhelming. While Ahsoka was the main character of the season, and probably the whole show, she did some weird things and was the focal point of the worst arc, so I went with Captain Rex instead. I love both characters about as much, but I definitely preferred Rex this season, who had a prominent role in the first and last arcs, and served his purpose well. It was fun to see his honorable nature clash with the Bad Batch's unconventional means, and I appreciated his resolve to get Echo back. It was awesome seeing him and his troops put on a welcoming party for Ahsoka, even designing their helmets orange to represent her. It was really sad to see him execute Order 66, but even then, he was the only clone to try and resist the Order, initially giving Ahsoka a hint to reverse the process. He then helped Ahsoka out, unfortunately against his own brethren, and it was heartbreaking seeing him cry from the fact. I already knew he would survive, because he was featured in Rebels before the Clone Wars actually ended, but I'm really glad that by far my favorite clone didn't die in the end. My favorite episode is a toss-up between 9 and 10, and while 10 has probably the best lightsaber duel in the show, and some of the best warfare, I think I'll have to go with episode 9 Old Friends Not Forgotten for how emotional it made me. Rex and his troops' welcoming party for Ahsoka that I mentioned was incredibly heartfelt, and so was the reunion between her and Anakin of course, who gave her some cool new lightsabers. The beginning scene of the episode with the clones, Anakin and Obi-Wan was also great, bringing back some of that snark to their golden relationship. The beginning of the siege was absolutely epic, with Ahsoka leaping from ship to ship while taking on every Mandalorian in sight. Her grabbing onto one of them after slicing their jetpack was awesome too. The ending to the episode was also dope, with Maul and Ahsoka meeting for the first time. It's pretty much the Clone Wars at its peak, and everything looked absolutely stunning. Number 5, Rick and Morty, Season 4 In 2019, Rick and Morty only saw 5 episodes that interchanged between being amazing and just good, and the same was the case for 2020, but I felt this set was a bit stronger overall. The first of these wasn't actually that praised, but I was personally really entertained by it, as I loved how meta it was. It was unexpected twist after unexpected twist, and the ending was especially hilarious. The episode after that wasn't as good, but still had fun elements to it. The Vat of Acid episode is what got praised the most, and I can't deny it was pretty ingenious, with a very interesting concept of respawning. The overly long scene of Morty getting a girlfriend was good stuff, and the payoff to it was hysterical. It was really funny seeing how petty Rick got, having Morty eat his words by having to fake his death in a vat of acid. That was a great way to bring it full circle. The episode after that was pretty much on par with Seven, but maybe a little better, as it was funny how Rick screwed an entire planet, and it was cool to see Jerry taking charge, not to mention Rick going up against Zeus himself. Lastly, the season final was really epic, finally bringing back Phoenix Person, which led to a top 10 anime fight. When I look at both parts of season 4, and the season as a whole, it might not have the best episodes, and it did have some clear low points, but it might have had the most 9 out of 10 episodes in the season of Rick and Morty yet, so I really enjoyed it. Hard to say if it's my favorite, but I definitely wouldn't call it a step down compared to previous seasons. I hate having to repeat myself, but Rick Sanchez is again without a doubt the best character of the show, and there's almost no competition. It's probably not his strongest showing yet, but he's yet again such a fun character, who always does something new and interesting. He was especially fun in episodes 6 and 8, and he fought like a damn warrior in 9 and 10. It was also interesting seeing him reflect at the end of the season, realizing how shitty of a father he is after the whole cloning situation of Beth. We've seen snippets of his insecurities throughout the series, and I hope to see more such scenes in the future. Despite popular opinion favoring the Vat of Acid episode, I myself enjoyed the season final the most, that being episode 10, Starmort, Return of the Jerry. 
First of all, what a punny title. Using Rick, Morty and even Jerry to parody the title to Star Wars Episode 6 Return of the Jedi, which is quite Star Wars-esque, like Phoenix Person acting like Darth Vader and Rick poking fun at Star Wars tropes. Phoenix Person and Tammy returning was something I had been waiting for since the season 3 premiere, so it was satisfying to get some payoff for that at last. The fight between him and Rick was legendary, being animated super well and it was crazy brutal. The episode also had its fair share of funny jokes, like invisible garbage truck Jerry and his peanut staying invisible. The funniest scene by far was when Rick ordered everyone to drop their weapons, except for Jerry, but Jerry had already dropped his and I loved how Rick reacted to that. It was an amazing season final, hard to say if it beats season 2's, but I'd say they're closely matched. Number 4, Attack on Titan, Season 4 It's unusual to see Attack on Titan placed this low, as it's usually my number 1, or number 2 at worst, but to be fair, only the first 4 episodes of the season released within 2020. Had I counted the rest, it most certainly would've made the top 2, but I'm saving those for the 2021 TV shows countdown. Number 4 still isn't bad for only having 4 episodes, although some other sets of 4 successive AOT episodes would make the top 2 on this list. That's not to say I found these first 4 episodes of season 4 underwhelming, but they're not exactly the cream of the crop. They're the setup right before shit goes down in episode 5 and onwards, and they did a damn good job setting things up. We're in a whole new area, following entirely new characters, which might be off-putting for some, but I found it really intriguing. The first episode slaps you in the face with some badass titan warfare, the second gives some much needed world building to Marley, the third has a captivating backstory that fleshes out the warrior's motivations further, and the fourth gives some backstory on Marley itself. All of these episodes introduce some pretty fascinating characters, like the wicked but good intentioned Gabby, the unusually kind Falco, the laid back Peak, the cocky Galliard, their Captain Magath, who seems more nuanced than most other Marleyan soldiers, and Willy Tiber, who interestingly gets a lot of respect despite being Eldian. That's the thing, Eldians get completely shat on by the whole world and are indoctrinated to follow Marley's every command, even if it means suicide. It speaks volumes to the show's themes of how cruel the world of AOT is, not to mention how people are fed fabricated information and fight on manipulative bases. These episodes also reintroduce some characters, in particular Reiner, who's basically the main character in Marley, and it was sad to see how utterly fed up with life he is, but also wholesome to see him pull through for the kids. I guess I can't ignore the elephant in the room, that this season was done by the animation studio MAPPA instead of WIT Studio, who did the other seasons. Despite some rough edges here and there, I think they've done a fantastic job adapting AOT, with some gorgeous scenery in every episode and the animation is fluid as well. Some have complained about the substantial use of CGI, and while it is noticeable, I think it looks pretty good. It definitely beats the Colossal Titan from seasons 2 and 3. These 4 episodes, while not enough for me to put AOT higher on the list, were still really great and the best is fortunately yet to come. Although Reiner was practically the main character and has gotten really interesting development leading up to this point, I think Gabby was my favorite character of these episodes. That might be because her scenes were far lighter, making me smile a bunch, whereas Reiner's were incredibly depressing. She is crazy, there's no doubt about that, but she's still really entertaining to watch, especially when she threw those grenades at that armored train. It showed her competency as well, both physically and mentally, being able to convince Magath to carry out that plan in a pretty funny way. It's also cool since that meant 800 Eldian soldiers didn't have to become suicide bombers. She does become less likable as the season goes on, but also more interesting, and there's a hint of her later developments at the dinner scene with Reiner's family. My favorite episode was the season premiere, episode 1, The Other Side of the Ocean. This isn't the deepest episode, but man oh man do I love it! Not only does it do a splendid job introducing a new place with new characters along with new conflicts, but it also shows how titan warfare is done in kind of a World War II setting, which is just amazing to witness. Even without the titans, the warfare is so well done, but the titans really do add a lot. I had hoped to see more of the armored car titan, I freaked out when I first saw that in the trailer, but at least the jaw, armored and beast titans were put to good use. So were the regular titans that got airdropped from the airship, which was another scene I freaked out over when I first saw it in the trailer. 
It's messed up in so many ways and is terrifying to witness, but it's also just so awesome to see. The music that played at that point and until the end of the episode is spectacular by the way. It really added a lot to that scene. Of course, the episode is also amazing for what Gabby does as I mentioned, and I wonder if Falco's ramblings about swinging through the air slaying titans will come into play, or if it was just a meta joke for the viewers. Number 3. South Park Season 24 This is a weird one to talk about, since South Park only had one episode in 2020, so automatically, my favorite episode was Episode 1, The Pandemic Special. It was very special indeed, since this is the best South Park has been since season 19. That's why it's so high despite only being an episode, and to be fair, it is 45 minutes long, so it's basically two episodes. I think the length is part of why I love it, since it has way more breathing room than other episodes that don't have enough time to cover their bloated topics. This episode on the other hand does, and it's really refreshing. Even though the Tegrity Weed subplot has since long run its course, it was surprisingly still really entertaining in this episode, which had Randy Marsh actually causing the pandemic due to fucking a bat. At least that's what it seemed like at first. It actually turned out to be caused by fucking a pangolin instead, which was an even funnier reveal. It was also hilarious how Randy thought he could beat Corona by beating it off, coming into all this weed. That led to the funniest moment of the entire episode, where people developed Randy Starches after inhaling his cum. When I saw Jimbo with a mustache like that, I guffawed. It was also real funny seeing his wife with that mustache, revealing that she does in fact smoke Randy's weed, funnily enough resetting Randy's development. The other plot was really good too, with Stan using Butters' desire to go to Build-A-Bear as a cover for Stan wanting to do that himself. It made for an interesting character struggle. It was also interesting that Cartman abstained from killing the pangolin in the end, only for it to get roasted by Mr. Garrison Trump. It's funny that he wants to keep the pandemic going to get rid of the Mexicans. It was also funny how the police got involved with the school, and always aimed at Token for simply being black. This episode pretty much had it all, which you'd expect from a South Park episode covering the absolute shit show that was 2020, and there's more of that to come. It is weird that South Park is this high despite only lasting 45 minutes, but it's because I was so satisfied with this episode that it's my number 3. Despite how overused he's been in the last seasons, Randy Marsh was still my favorite character yet again. It helps that this episode was the best that Tegrity has to offer, and he really was so damn funny. The very fact that he caused the pandemic by going to China and fucking some animals is hilarious, and so were his reactions to realizing this. There's also the fact that he came into the weed in order to vaccinate everyone, which didn't even work. This being said, I hope they dial him down in the future, which the next special did, so that was greatly appreciated. Number 2. Q Season 4 Q has only been with me for a year, so I did not expect it to place number 2 on this list. To be fair, that's partly because other shows on this list greatly varied in quality, or didn't have enough episodes to be worth putting higher. That being said, I wasn't the biggest fan of part 1 of this season. I'd probably enjoy it more if I rewatched it, but I think it would still be my least favorite core of the series. Despite that, it was definitely an important first half, which the second half would prove. Kageyama went through quite the phase of becoming a more decisive setter, and it almost seemed like he was about to revert, or at least retread old habits, but Hinata brought him back in such an epic crowning scene. Hinata's ball boy experience most certainly didn't go to waste, improving him both physically and mentally, being able to make a perfect receive against Inarisaki, and realizing how important it is to take it easy in stressful situations. It made for a great through line for the entire season, and while season 4 might be my least favorite of the show, it's not far behind the others by any stretch. Okay, it is noticeably weaker in terms of art and production quality, which is another reason why it's probably my least favorite. You see, the anime got a completely new art style with its fourth season, with all new character models and such, and while I don't think it's bad, I thought it looked better before. That isn't helped by the fact that the second part's production struggled due to corona-induced restrictions, which of course can't be helped, so that was unfortunate. I have to say the Inarisaki match was a bit long, considering it was the same length as the Shira Torisawa match, which seemed more monumental, and had 5 sets as opposed to just 3. Even so, it was a great match, one of the best in the series, and had some amazing moments, like the end of the first set, which elevated Tanaka's character, even though he already was one of my top three. 
The final set was also amazing, where Hinata's ball boy experience finally paid off with his perfect receive, and the rally where that happened was insane. The most insane rally however was the very last one, where everyone gave it their all, the screen gained shadowy outlines to convey the pressure, Hinata cleared the fog away with his take it easy receive, and both Hinata and Kageyama simultaneously blocked the twins free quick. The Mia twins being able to pull off that free quick was a great reversal, and it was terrifying whenever they used it. A benefit with this match's length was that there was a lot of time dedicated to characterizing the players at Inarisaki, and the captain Kita was especially endearing, having such an admirable work ethic, and the way he fleshed out the concept of geniuses was incredibly insightful. Outside of the match, it was wonderful to get some Nekoma spotlight as well, which was kind of needed, considering they'll finally face Karasuno in the next match. The battle at the garbage dump has been built up since midway through season 1, so it's definitely my most anticipated moment of the series, and the season final did an excellent job at hyping me up for that even further. Playing the first opening in full at the end was a great touch, and it made me very happy to see Kenma finally smile at the day of the match. This season had many great characters to choose from, but given that both parts focused on him more than most other characters, I just had to go with Hinata. Both were greatly focused on Kageyama as well, who is my favorite character of the show overall, but I felt Hinata had a greater showing this time around. Admittedly, I was pretty annoyed with him when he was stupid enough to take Tsukushima's joking advice of sneaking into the training camp, but I'm glad he swallowed his pride and became a ball boy, which ended up being the most important development he's gotten. He was certainly the MVP of the Inarisaki match, with his wholly positive mood affecting his teammates to take it easy and just have fun playing volleyball. His passion for the sport is simply unrivaled, and whereas he didn't quite have the skills to back up that passion before, he does now. There were a handful of amazing episodes this season, like 22 through 25, but even though it might not be the best episode objectively, I think my favorite was episode 16, Broken Heart. While Hinata was my favorite character of the season, Tanaka was probably my second favorite, and I prefer him a bit overall, so it was awesome to finally get an entire episode dedicated to him. This one was edited really nicely together with flashbacks of his childhood friend Kanaka, who became a potential love interest, until that potential vanished, given how driven Tanaka is to get together with Kyoko. Despite how unrealistic that goal might be, you have to admire his drive, and his mental capacity was especially admirable during the end of the first set against Inarisaki, where he screwed up almost every time. Most people would break under the pressure, and while it seemed Tanaka would, he managed to pick himself back up. The last point was so well done, with great art and animation, not to mention music, and him finally pulling off that cross shot was a sight to behold. I love that the second year substitutes were all laughing, not because he's so over the top, but because he's simply an awesome guy. While I did ship Tanaka and Kanaka, it was a cool subversion that they probably won't end up together after all, and Kanaka realizing that, saying her heart got broken was a sad, but also a really impactful end to the episode. Number 1. My Hero Academia Season 4 While I had a tough time figuring out my top 7 to 2, there really was no question what my number 1 would be, and while that might be because some of the shows I saw were disappointing, and some others barely had any episodes, I truly did love the remainder of My Hero Academia's 4th season. I say remainder, since the first 11 episodes of the season came out in 2019, so I'm not counting those, but even so, 12 through 25 was a fantastic set of episodes. I'll admit, I was a bit let down by how those first 11 episodes adapted the manga material, but I'm more receptive towards them in retrospect, and the rest of the season was handled really well for the most part. Season 4 might actually be my favorite yet, because while it doesn't contain my favorite arc, and has some below average episodes, it has a great deal of variety, not just in terms of arcs, but also characters and quirks. It also had plenty of unexpected peaks sprinkled throughout, like the climax to the culture festival, which I enjoyed reading in the manga, but I didn't love it until it got animated. Gentle and Labrava was already such a lovable duo, but the backstory they got made them even more sympathetic, and the fight in which it occurred became one of my favorites in the anime thus far. Deku and Eri vs Overhaul was also incredible. While Deku and Eri combining their powers is cheating, it was a very clever way to use both of their broken quirks all out, leading to an awesome Super Saiyan moment. The aftermath was amazing too, Shigaraki finally showing some intimidation, and while Naidai is one of the only characters to die in the show thus far, it was the most hard-hitting one by far. 
Deku crying isn't anything new, but seeing All Might shed a tear and Mirio bawl his eyes out for his deceased mentor is hard not to cry from. I'm glad the bright future message got carried throughout the whole season, being an important saying for both Deku and Mirio, and it was fantastic seeing Eri finally smile for the first time ever from the Class 1A concert. That concert was beautifully crafted, and basically paid off the whole season. That still wasn't the end however, as we still got Endeavor and Hawks vs the high-end Nomu, which I really didn't expect would be adapted within the season, but I'm so glad it was. It probably wouldn't be my favorite season without it. This season introduced many great new characters and developed some old ones. While Mirio was my favorite of the first 11 episodes, and is probably my favorite of the season overall, I think my top 3 in 2020 were Gentle, Endeavor and Hawks. Since Endeavor and Hawks didn't have quite as much screen time, I'm going with Gentle Criminal on this one. He might have seemed like a throwaway antagonist, but the sheer charisma of this guy is super endearing. The concept of a YouTube villain is really funny, relatable, and actually pretty interesting, as it ties in with his motivations of not wanting to be forgotten. He had a very unfortunate upbringing, not doing very well at a hero course, and accidentally interfered with hero work, which led to him and his family being ostracized. He's basically the unlucky version of Deku, but that didn't stop him from remaining heroic, despite referring to himself as a criminal. The way he tried to protect Labrave in the end was nothing short of selfless, and he's always treated her so well. I love the attention to detail that he drew dark circles around his eyes to make Labrave feel more comfortable with hers. He's not just hilarious, but also a great guy, although he did have to be stopped, because otherwise the students of UA would be robbed of the awesome festival, and Eri would have been robbed of her precious smile. I was so glad to see him and Labrava be given a second chance by the police, and I hope we'll see more of them in the bright future. I had one 10 out of 10 episode out of the first 11 episodes that came out during 2019, that being the last one, Lemillion, whereas I have four 10 out of 10s for 2020, those being 13, 22, 23, and 25. I've already sung my praises for the concert and the fights against Overhaul and Gentle, but Endeavor and Hawks vs the High End Nomu in episode 25 his start was simply unbeatable. My Hero Academia has never had such a crazy season final, until season 4, which is not only the best season final of MHA by far, but probably also my favorite episode in all of MHA. Now, that might be weird to say, considering it barely features the main character and hasn't had much build up. In fact, this fight pretty much came out of nowhere, but the way it was handled, and what impact it'll have for later events was simply exceptional. While Endeavor didn't have much screen time within the season, there were hints of his betterment throughout, and this episode showcases that in full force. He's not just fighting this random Nomu, he's basically fighting himself, his former self, who was a power-hungry man who sought to challenge and surpass the ultimate power, that being All Might. Speaking of which, this fight mirrors All Might's fight against All for One in so many clever ways. Both fights are being broadcasted so that we see the reactions of several important characters, and all of Japan really, and the outcome to both fights will determine whether Hero Society's reputation will survive, considering all the unease in Japan lately. All Might had his last stand as the number one hero, whereas Endeavor just became the number one hero, and therefore has to prove himself in All Might's absence. Also, Endeavor clearly mimics All Might's victory pose at the end of his fight, only it does it with the other arm. The symbolism doesn't stop there, as this fight is jam-packed with that, much of it thanks to Hawks. This guy got introduced just the episode before, so this episode is part of his character introduction, and what an introduction it is. It might be the best in all of MHA, rivaling Mirio's, and it just so happens that these two have my favorite quirks in the series. The way Hawks can manipulate his feathers is nothing short of incredible, and proves why he's the number two hero, even when he doesn't want to be, but his godlike control makes him the perfect support hero, saving people left and right without breaking a sweat, while Endeavor is taking care of the heavy fighting. That's not to say Hawks can't fight, as he does do that too, with awesome feather swords no less, but his role in this fight is more about supporting and distracting. As for the symbolism, he's funnily enough the ultimate wingman for Endeavor, backing him up, both literally and figuratively, by making him out to be the MVP of this fight, so that he can become a leader for Hero Society, and Hawks even lends Endeavor his feathers. This leads to Endeavor basically becoming a phoenix, which is oh so poetic, given that Endeavor is reborn in flames, after seemingly getting killed, and also rebirthing as a better person than he was before. The very fact that this episode alone turns Endeavor from being one of the most hated characters to one of the most admirable is simply incredible, and this is just the beginning of his start. 
Alright, that's enough with the overanalyzing, even though there would be plenty more to discuss, but I obviously have to talk about the direction too. The fight against Overhaul had certain instances of godlike animation, but this episode had it throughout the whole thing. I also love how the backdrop was pink as opposed to the boring blue sky that usually accompany these fights. It was super refreshing and made for some absolutely beautiful shots. The song selection was great too, with a badass theme that's often associated with Endeavor, and a sadder one that's associated with the Todoroki family altogether. The theme that played in the after credits was beautiful too, and that scene was a nice little cherry on top, cementing this episode as my favorite, especially of season 4. I didn't mean for my discussion about my favorite episode to be longer than the one about the show itself, but what can I say? This is one of my favorite episodes of television period, and it only gets better with hindsight. That's it for this list, and it was very strange to say the least. Some of the shows would have been higher had they been more consistent, or had more episodes, particularly The Clone Wars and Attack on Titan. Number 7 through 2 were thus closely matched, making it really hard to rank them, and that ranking isn't set in stone. There was a clear winner though, as My Hero Academia not only had the quantity, but also the quality, and it rather satisfied than disappointed me. When it comes to 2021, I don't know if as many shows will air, but I already know three of them are fantastic, with Attack on Titan Season 4 continuing, South Park receiving more specials, and My Hero Academia getting its fifth season, the content of which I already know is good from reading the manga. Also, while The Clone Wars is over, a show dedicated to The Bad Batch will come out, and while that's not nearly as hype, it's still something to look forward to. I'll assume the Dragon Prince and Primal will return, and hopefully some other shows will too. I'm most looking forward to Vinland Saga Season 2, Stranger Things Season 4, Q Season 5, and Better Call Saul's final season, so I hope they don't take too long to arrive. I'm Arcadon, and hopefully, you'll see me next time!